Over the next few months, we'll implement the 64-bit version of the x86 architecture, also known as x64. Each of its instructions follows a specific format called the instruction encoding. So before we tackle any specific operations, let's define some nodes that make this encoding a lot simpler. The format can be broken down into multiple components, the prefixes, the opcode, the register-related bytes and the values. Each of these components is either optional or has multiple variations, lending itself perfectly to modular node design. Instead of constructing a single complicated node that contains all necessary functionality, we will instead build multiple smaller nodes, one for each component. Central to each operation is the fittingly named opcode, a sequence of up to four bytes. The most common version we'll encounter are the so-called legacy opcodes. These include fundamental instructions like integer addition and multiplication, but also floating point operations via the x87 extension. Another type of opcode are the so-called vex opcodes, which we'll use to extend our vector functionality later on. For now, we'll only define a node for legacy opcode usage, but we'll design everything else with future VEX opcodes in mind. Opcode functionality is somewhat similar to how UTF-8 works. Certain bytes are used to signal that a following byte is part of the current construct. The fundamental operations are identified by a single byte, while younger additions are represented by two or three. The bytes used as escape characters are fixed, lending themselves to a simple selection input. Within the compiler, we can map selectable options to byte sequences by connecting them to a value node. The values are then connected to a byte node, which accepts multiple binary strings and converts them to the corresponding byte sequence. While it appears like we're simply concatenating all possible escape sequences, these value nodes only output their corresponding value if they are activated. By connecting their activation sockets to option nodes, only the value node connected to the one selected option will be active. We'll also add an empty option here, since not every opcode will have an escape sequence. With the escape sequences done, let's now add a simple hexadecimal input. This socket will be used to specify the actual opcode byte that identifies any given specific operation. We can configure text sockets to only allow certain characters by adding them to this parameter here. For hexadecimal input, we'll simply add all 16 hex characters. Since we want users to define a single byte, meaning exactly two of these characters, we'll set both the minimum and maximum input length to two. The hex byte 00 corresponds to the integer addition instruction, which doesn't feel like a suitable default value. Instead, let's set the default opcode to 90, which is a special operation that does nothing. Now, let's add some formatting to convert this hex code into a binary string, which we'll then append to our final bytes. There is one final consideration we need to make for this legacy opcode definition, the so-called rex prefix. The rex prefix is an additional byte we need to place in front of our opcode if we ever want to use 64-bit values or any of the 64-bit registers. Since this byte is optional, it's easier to move this functionality to a separate node. All we need to do in this current node is add a named socket, which can only connect to outputs that provide a rex prefix. We can accomplish this by adding a special data type. To finalize this legacy opcode definition, all that's left to do is push our byte sequence to an output with an appropriate type. The definition of the rex prefix is fairly simple. It's a single byte consisting of four fixed and four variable bits. The first of these variable bits tells the machine that the following instruction is using a 64-bit parameter. Since only a handful of x64 instructions default to these 64-bit parameters, we'll need to set this bit whenever an operation doesn't. 
the other three bits simply act as extensions to some small numbers, which are stored in the previously mentioned register-related components. They essentially allow us to address the additional 64-bit registers, since the legacy 3-bit numbers only have room for the eight older ones. We can represent all four bits using some switch inputs, which provide truth values to a node graph. These booleans can be converted to their binary equivalents 0 and 1, which we then simply push into another byte node after the fixed bit sequence. We'll set our output type to the same string we provided in our legacy opcode, ensuring their connectability. Besides this specific prefix, additional prefixes can be used to tune certain operation functionality further. The most fundamental prefixes are the so-called legacy prefixes, which come in four different groups. For any given instruction, at most one prefix of each group is permitted. More than one instance of the same group leads to undefined behavior. This lends itself to pretty straightforward node design since it essentially boils down to only four selection inputs, each again equipped with an additional empty option. They work exactly like the escape sequence selection in our opcode node, just with more options. Some of these legacy prefixes are mandatory for certain opcodes, so we'll need to make sure to add them once we get to those instructions. In general, we'll discuss what each of these prefixes does when we get around to using them. Explaining each one now would just overcomplicate this video. Looking ahead, the aforementioned VEX instructions utilize a custom prefix design intended to replace these legacy prefixes, so future implementations of those opcodes simply won't use this prefix node at all. In my opinion, the most complex component of this encoding is the so-called mod RM field. In general, modRM allows us to further extend our opcode by three bits or specify up to two registers, which may hold parameters for an operation. In control of this functionality is the two-bit section at the start of each modRM byte. Each possible value maps to a certain addressing mode, allowing us to either directly or indirectly reference a register. That reference is encoded in the last three bits of mod RM, which can be extended by one bit via the rex prefix mentioned earlier. We'll be referencing this table pretty often in upcoming devlogs, so I'll explain it in more detail when we need it. Finally, the remaining bits can either represent an opcode extension or another register. Like the other byte section, these three bits can also be extended by one bit using the rex prefix, in terms of implementation, modRM is deceptively straightforward. Both the first and last field are constructed using option-to-value mapping, just like in previous nodes. We'll identify the options of the last field by the pair of registers each value will target. The only novel technique we'll use in this node is the usage of multiple input types. The middle field can receive both a register reference or an opcode extension. So we'll connect two type nodes to the relevant port, allowing for connections of two different data types. Type nodes act similar to option nodes, capable of activating their successor if the correct type of data is received will allow a direct bit specification by making this port a text socket and only allowing zeros and ones as input. Let's again enforce the correct value size by setting both limits to three. All that's left to do now is concatenate all the bit strings into a single mod RM byte and output it using the correct type. The second register-related byte is the so-called SIB byte, which stands for scale, index, and base. The number encoded by the SIB byte is used by mod RM in specific circumstances. It's commonly used to calculate an offset into an array, since we need memory addresses relative to the array beginning in such cases. SIB is closely tied to mod RM since the usage of its three encoded numbers changes based on the mod field. In terms of node graph implementation, it couldn't be easier though. 
The first two bits are mapped to four different scaling factors using our established option value mappings. The other two three-bit fields are simple binary text sockets just like in mod RM. However, since these index and base fields both just store registers, there is only one connected type node. After we've concatenated these binary strings, just like every other byte so far, we've got our finished SIB node. Each x64 instruction can have up to two values at their tail. The first acts as a displacement utilized by mod RM for register relative addressing. The second acts as a simple instruction input, usually referred to as an immediate value. Both of these values can utilize 64 bits, however only one can do so at any given time. If both displacement and immediate value are required simultaneously, they are limited to 32 bits. These values are essentially just integers, which we've already implemented in the last devlog, so no further work is needed for now. Now that we've got all our instruction components set up, all that's left to do is combine them in the correct order. So we'll simply build a couple of named inputs connected to type nodes with values matching our component outputs. By changing the port slots, we can enforce the required ordering. Then we'll channel the incoming data into a join node and output the resulting byte string. That should conclude our instruction encoding setup. Let's test it by replicating the output of a traditional compiler. I wrote a simple C function that adds two 64-bit integers to each other. The resulting disassembly is an add instruction referencing two registers. So let's try and emulate this. Both of these registers are 64 bits wide. So we'll add a rex prefix and activate the 64-bit operand flag. However, both registers aren't part of the extended set from register 8 to 15. So we'll leave the register extension bit at zero. Let's channel this rex prefix into our opcode node and look up the hex number we'll require. Since we're working with 64-bit data, we can't use opcode 00, since that addition operation only works on 8-bit data. Instead, let's use the opcode 01, which seems to allow our data size. To actually reference the two registers, we'll build a mod RM byte. Since we want the last field to be a direct register reference, let's set the mode accordingly. In assembly, the target register is always written first, so we'll reference our first register in the last three bits. Finally, let's look up the binary code for the second register and channel it into our register field in the middle. After pushing all bytes into our combination node, we receive the following byte string. If we cross-reference that with the actual bytes in our test case, we can see that they match perfectly. So now that we've got a solid approach to encoding our x64 instructions, we're only missing the container to actually ship these operations. In the next devlog, we'll have to tackle an executable file format. Shouldn't be too complicated, right?